Melodic sequencing. We're going to talk about that concept while we learn Joe Henderson's Recordame. I've got a free PDF of a duet and a lead sheet for you, so we can learn all this in context. We've got a lot to cover. Let's get cracking. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace, and if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses and product reviews, please do subscribe and be sure to hit the like button. All the cool kids are doing it. Now, today we're starting a new series of learning jazz standards, starting with the famous Joe Henderson standard, Recordame off page one. Fantastic album, Blue Note Records, engineered by Rudy Van Gelder. It sounds fantastic. Now, unfortunately, I can't give you the lead sheet. It's not my intellectual property but I can do something that will be very helpful indeed. Not only am I gonna give you the chord changes so we can talk about this and you can print them out and see them, I'm also gonna give you a brand new contrafact. Now a contrafact is a time-honored tradition in jazz where you take an existing set of chord changes and write a brand new melody. Pick up any of your favorite jazz albums, chances are there's a contrafact on there. Ornithology is a contrafact over how high the moon. Uh, there's gazillions of them. So my colleague, Christopher Peebles, who plays tenor saxophone with the Sonnenots, wrote a brand new tune over these score changes that you're going to get to download for free. So click the link. You can see the full performance of our band and the lead sheet and the duet of the new tune, Farcaster. <laughs> So let's talk about how to solo over recordame, dive into a little bit of form and analysis. So take a look at the chord changes. We can see it's a 16 bar form that I kind of think of in two sections, the first eight bars and the last eight bars. Now in the first eight bars, we only have two chords. And this is a trait of modal jazz, where we have long stretches of one key area without strong functional harmony. There's not chords pulling or leading anywhere else. It's kind of static, but in a very cool way. So this long stretch of a single chord gives us a lot of freedom, a lot of room for creativity, but it also poses an interesting problem. If you've defined your job as a saxophonist when we're soloing as outlining chord changes, well, Houston, we've got a big problem because there's only one chord. Only so many times I'm gonna wanna hear you outline that thing. But if you have viewed your job as I tend to teach my students as our job when soloing is building melodic content over key areas, the context that the chords create well, then we have a lot of room for exploration and some fun ideas we can explore. So one common device we can use to make our solos more interesting, more melodic over these long areas is using sequencing, melodic sequencing. Now a sequence is where we take a short melodic idea that can also be called a motif or a motive. If you studied in the American universities I went to, we often use the word motive rather than motif. So if you hear me say motive, I know it's a different word. I'm not mispronouncing motif though I usually use motive as the noun in motific, as in motific development, as the adjective. I realize it's a little mixed up, but then again, I drive a car with a three liter engine and a 20 gallon gas tank. America. So it's not the same as a simple pattern that we simply outline the different chords with and repeat to the different chord areas. It's developing a melodic device. And this is incredibly common. It's ubiquitous in classical music. And if you listen to some of your favorite jazz solos, You'll hear this in varying degrees in some very interesting ways, especially when we listen to modal jazz, where we have these long stretches of one key area. So let's start with a very simple example. Here we have an arpeggiated figure where the intervals largely stay the same. We have an arpeggiated device ascending. Take a listen. <laughs> Now let's take a look at the second four bars and use a different motion. This time we're gonna use a more scalar approach of ascending and descending of the mode, the Dorian mode that fits over this chord so well. Let's take a listen to this example. Now you being a perfectly intelligent adult, you don't need me pointing out the step motion and intervallic content. I can tell you it goes up or down, and then it goes up, up, and then it goes down, and then it hits the third, or you could simply look at it. But more importantly, 
when we're figuring out how to play, how to improvise, naming intervallic content is pretty far down the list on my priorities. And honestly, when most people are improvising, they're not thinking these things. We hear something in our head and we play it, which is why I like my students to experience playing these ideas, these motions, not so much naming the intervals. It's like the world's worst real estate agent where you walk into a house and say, there's the sink, this is the kitchen. Yeah, I can see that. You can see where it goes up or down. Don't worry so much about does it go up a third or a second. Listen to it, hear it, feel it, play it, experience it, rather than talking about it quite so much. Now let's spice things up with an example from an actual improvised solo. First up from my tenor saxophonist, Christopher Peebles. So a fairly simple figure of leaping up a fifth, if you want to know the interval, and down a step, it's repeated several times, and he spices things up a bit more with some cool 16th note pickups. So let's take a listen to this slowly first. And another interesting thing to point out is he starts this sequence in the A section and continues it into the B section, transitioning over phrases, continuing that melodic motive, that melodic sequence. Very cool. Now let's hear that melodic sequence in the context of his actual solo that he was improvising. <laughs> Let's talk about the last eight bars where we have more chord movement. Here we have a shift to G major with a 2-5 leading to F major, then a 2-5 leading to E flat major. That's quite a few chords in a short span of time. I prefer to think of this as simply G major, then a bar of G minor, then a bar of F major, then a bar of F minor. It can sound that way or you can hear the 2-5. One way is not right or wrong. To my ear, I prefer to think of it as G major, G minor, F major, F minor, and that makes us very fertile ground for melodic sequences. So let's start with an easy, rather pedantic example of how to outline this and create a sequence over these series of chord changes. <laughs> Now let's look at an actually improvised example, a bit more complex. We have more of an arpeggiated pattern with repeated 16ths, but you see, it's not an exact sequence. It's the basic motion, the basic direction, not literally a pattern that's repeated across four bars. Listen to it slowly once and see if you can pick up on the motive that happens throughout these four bars. Now let's hear it in context when I was actually improvising. And now it's your turn. I want you to put on iReal Pro or whatever backing track you use. Put it on a loop of four bars, one long section. You can use our examples as a starting point or get creative. You should always get creative and make up your own. Find ideas that work for you and just experiment. The way to do it in an improvised setting is to do it first practice. We have to prepare before we can do it live in the heat of battle. I promise you nothing magical happens on the actual stage or in the recording studio. We have to practice our ideas in advance and some of those ideas if we're lucky, will come out when we're improvising, though not in exactly the way we maybe intended. So have some fun, experiment, and I will see you next week when we dive more into other ways to solo over this tune. We're going to talk about modes and minor scales and have a lot more fun. So I hope you have a most fantastic week, and I will see you very soon. But go practice. <laughs>